Um, yeah, so <laughs> um, I've only actually been working for um, a London-based tailor for about four years. Um, I've been sewing since I was old enough to stick um, a darning needle, some yarn through a plastic hole punched card. Um, but I used to be a lawyer um, and when I left law, I thought I, I don't really know what I want to do anymore. And long story short, I ended up working for a tailor. I went for the job interview um, and I had to do an audition to show that I could use the sewing machine and that I could hand sew because the number of people that they get turning up saying, I can do this. And then when you actually get them on the factory floor and they can't, um, so you have to now do an audition. Um, and I got the job. Um, and about a year ago, um, I was made head of the pant line. Um, so I'm the only person on the line that can make a pair of pants from start to finish. Um, apart from the cutting, because we're tailors, um, master cutters are completely separate from what we do. Um, it's completely different training. Um, they have very little idea really about how a garment actually goes together. They just know how to cut the pieces and what size to cut the pieces. Um, so I get the pieces pre-cut and then my job is to assemble everything so that it looks like something that a person would be happy to spend 800 pounds on. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much me. Um, my work gets, we have a lot of visiting tailors, so my work goes to them as well. So my work has been um, sold by um, Savile Row tailors like Eves and Hawks, Huntsman, K uh, KHL, um, and it's gone all over the world. Um, and I'm saying for very famous people, um, we made the suit that um, Colin Firth and is it Taryn Edgerton? War in Kingsman and Kingsman 2. Um, That's insane. Yeah. Um, it, they all say Huntsman, but it wasn't. It was us. <laughs> um, we made the suit that Robbie Williams wore in the video that he did with Nicole Kidman. Um, I've made clothes for various actors. Um, Niall Rogers. He's like the granddaddy of Bunk, I believe. I don't know, I'm a, I'm a former goth, so <laughs> my knowledge of music outside um, goth is pretty limited. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I do. So when I'm at work all day, I, am, I, I don't do anything other than making trousers. I wouldn't know how to put a jacket together if you paid me, um, but I can make a mean pair of trousers. So I'm kind of hoping that I will be able to show some of what I do to you guys so that you'll have an extra skill in about an hour's time. So I've cut my back pant piece from the pattern that um, Lauren from Wearing History has kindly allowed us to use. Um, I just used a bit of what I call cabbage um, that I had lying around because I, I didn't have a pair of pants that I particularly needed to cut um, at this exact moment in time that I could have worked on to show you. So cabbage it is. Um, I have my pocket bag and I have my welt pocket facing, the welt pocket piece itself a piece of non-fusible interfacing and some fusible interfacing that's just like a lightweight cotton tape. Um, um, let me just jump in here. Did you guys find the um, the cotton wigan that is that we have in the lab? Polly should have put it out for everybody. I know theater people have it. <laughs> It, it should be like a strip of um, a strip of tape, like what she showed you. I think we ordered black. Oh, it is. It's in the box. It's wider though. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. 
So just so you guys know where that is so you can cut what you need when you need it. Okay, sorry, continue on. No, no, that's, that's fine. So I've got all my fabric pieces. Um, tools wise, did a pair of scissors. I have a set square. It's not obligatory to use this. It's just force of habit from work um, because our QC um, isn't called Hawkeye's kind of thing. Um, and she will actually measure with a set square to make sure that I've got my pocket set perfectly against the dart and that the, each end of my pocket is exactly the same uh, depth from the bottom of the waistband. So I also have a metal ruler and some wax. Um, any kind of fabric marker will do. I'm just used to using wax. And um, you could use, uh, okay. I don't, can you see that? It's like a vanishing pencil. Yeah. And um, it's like ink. Um, and some pins. So the first thing that you need to do, um, hopefully everyone has overlocked everything. Yes? I can't hear anyone. She can hear you guys if you, if you speak up. <laughs> I believe on the instructions we received, only two of the pieces need to have overlocking on the top. Uh, yeah, only you only need to look, overlock yeah. that piece. And I did suggest that it might be easier for you guys to overlock your like your pant pack piece. Um, but you can overlock it after it really doesn't matter. It just makes it easier to work with because you're not dealing with like fraying fabric bits everywhere. Perfect. So the first, can you all see my table? Can you see yes. my table? Yeah. Okay. So I've spread out my oh, um, my pattern piece. Needs to go this way around. So you want it um, wrong side facing up so that the dart is facing up, like so. Um, now on men's pattern um, that we would normally use at work, um, our darts are usually a lot shorter. They're usually about three and a half to four inches um, from the top to the bottom. Um, but I followed the instructions given on um, the wearing history pattern because um, that's the way she specifies the dart to be done. If you needed to shorten the dart um, and take it in so that you were you get a less pronounced curve, then you would need to compensate for that by removing some of the waistband because you're, you're effectively, by having a smaller dart at the top, having you'll end up with a longer waistband length. So you'd need to chop some of that length off to compensate for the fact that you're reducing the dart. Um, at work, we would normally have it so that the dart disappears into the welt pocket and there's nothing underneath. Um, what we're gonna do today, because it's a longer dart, if I put the set the pocket here, that's quite low. Um, so we're going to go across the dart. Um, normally you would have it though, so that the dart finishes at the point where your um, pocket sits. So make sure that that's nice and straight and you put your fusible sticky side down and you just give it a quick press. To stick that into place. Turn your fabric over. Now I'm using I'm using black thread and black fusible because I thought it would be easier for you guys to see on camera. Obviously, if you're doing this for a pair of pants that you're going to give to somebody or you're going to wear for yourself um, or that you're going to sell, um, what you would do is colour match the thread to your fabric so that um, if the, the seam or the fabric starts to open, you don't see the colour of the thread that you've used. I have to think about this now. <laughs> right, so what you're going to do is lay 
the overlocked piece of your pocket facing, your welt facing, on top of where your dart, uh, sorry, where your fusible is. And then you're going to take your um, like non-fusible, um, slightly stiff interfacing and lay that on top. Now the top part of this will disappear inside the pocket bag. So that's why we've not bothered overlocking the top edge, only the bottom edge. You want the overlocked edge on the bottom because that way when you fold it through, you've got that side and that side then gets stitched down to the inside of your pocket bag. You need to take your pocket bag and hopefully the pattern piece will show that one edge has a slight corner cut off. That's the side that goes on your, your hip edge rather than your um, center seam edge. That gets laid underneath and you want it sitting half an inch, inch or so over the top because what you don't want to do when, when you're stitching your waistband in you want your fabric, all the fabric that's going into the waistband to be layered um, because it reduces the bulk, weirdly. I'm just going to double check again where I've got my... Placing. Just pull that down a little bit. Because what you want to be doing is stitching over where you've put the sticky interface on the inside because the whole purpose of that sticky interfacing tape is that it will um, basically um, stop the outside edge from fraying so that when you turn it through it will not fray hopefully she says. So I've pinned it down. Now I need to mark where my pocket's going to actually, my welt pocket is going to go. So I'm going to line it up. That's where that goes. And you're going to put your horizontal marker about halfway down should be should be roughly in the middle of where your interfacing is um, so what you would do if you're looking um slightly different technique if you're doing a double welt pocket but all you're doing is mirroring on top of what you've done on the bottom. So I'm going to work today on um, having a welt that is um, two centimetres deep. So I'm going to mark just correct that way slightly. Oh, wrong side. And unlike most of the tutorials that you see on YouTube and stuff, when they're teaching you how to do welt pockets, they'll have you stitch all the way around like you would for a band buttonhole. Um, I don't do that because I'm awkward. Um, I do mine slightly differently. So I'm going to have a two and a quarter inch each. Oh, damn. Thank you. 
um, two and a quarter inch. So my pocket is going to run from there to there. I want probably about an inch at least, a little bit under, um, on leftover space on either side because when you turn it through, um, you will need that extra um, space. So what I'm going to do is stitch two tram lines down like that. Okay. Is everyone with me so far? Yes. Yeah. It's really hard because I can't see anyone, so I don't know what anyone's like. Um, don't worry, man. I just know but I want to make sure that I'm not getting too fast for anyone. So my machine is an industrial machine, so it has automatic back tack. Um, so I'm just going to take it back a little bit to make sure I do actually hit. I really need to know where that funny noise is coming from. So you've stitched all the way through all four layers, your interfacing, your pocket facing, your pant piece and your pocket bag, and you've got two tram lines. Yeah, everyone got that? This is where you need to be brave. Because what you're going to do where you've drawn that line in the middle, you're gonna cut down it, but you're, you're going to cut, I would say leave, ooh, at least three quarters of an inch. So you're going to cut from there to there along this line, all the way through all four layers. This is where my sister just died that they've had enough. Oh, oh it's not gone through the pocket. Okay. Okay, so I've got a little bit of an opening, but what I need to do now is cut an inverted V from where I stopped cutting to the edge. Now, what you have to do is take it as close to the stitching as you dare. You don't want to get too close to the stitching. I've literally got like a millimeter between where I've cut and the end of my stitching. I'll do the same on the other side. Okay. And then what you do on the other side is I, sh I probably should have picked a bit of cabbage that wasn't black. Is double check that you've actually taken your underneath cut close because what you need to do to be able to flip this out and have it nice and smooth is not have any excess fabric in the way. Okay, 
So we've cut through. So when we flip through, and this is basically just a bigger version of a bound buttonhole. So if you can do this, then you can do a bound buttonhole. So because you've not stitched down these edges, these short side edges, they're actually laying really nice, even without pressing this, they're laying really nice and clean. Whereas if you stitch down these, like you would with a bound buttonhole, they don't lay very, very flat and they don't lay very clean. Um, so what we're going to do is have everything on the top side of your welt. Oh, I've forgotten where I'm at now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> lockdown's getting to me. It needs to go get flipped up. Because what you're going to do when you attach this bit, this will then become the back of the pocket. So that when you open the pocket, I'm going to put anything in. Ah, it's keep going, it's keep to vanish here. Um, you can just see the green behind and not black because the loose bottom end of this will be folded up to form. So you won't see any of what you've worked on when everything's all sealed up. Sorry, my husband's fiddling with the lights. So what you're going to do on the bottom edge, everything that you've stitched, so you can see your stitch line on the interfacing is pushed down and everything that you've pushed through the hole points up. So you need to press it so that your, the bottom edge of your pocket points up. So I'm just gonna press that quickly. Is everyone with me so far? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Oh, God. Right. So we're going to have. Oh, I don't think I've made this long enough. I haven't made it long enough. Right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to trim off because I've, I've, <laughs> I'm the one that's teaching you how to do this and I've stuck it up. I'm going to take some of that edge off. Because what I want to do Is have that folded over so that forms the pocket the, the bottom of the well and then you stitch along there to stitch it into place so I'm going to press that so that it's nice and flat and it feels weird to, I don't like this it feels weird to be pressing sitting down have from that side mm 
is like that. Is that is that clear for everyone? Can everyone see that? Yeah. Beautiful. And on the back, it looks like that. So you've got your top part that's still loose and flappy and not pressed. This is the, the back edge of your, your welt pocket. So this is the point now where you would um, put a buttonhole in if you wanted a buttonhole um, in your, your pocket. Um, I don't. Um, tailors have very, very strange rules about buttonholes and pockets. Um, sometimes they will say just put a button, you'll have um, a pair of pants with welt pockets on each side, um, but only one will have a buttonhole and a button. Sometimes they'll have both pockets will have buttonholes. It's, it's very peculiar. It's all down to what the client wants. Um, and um, my um, input as to whether that looks stupid or not is usually um, not wanted. <laughs> so what we've got to do, we've got to stitch this piece down. So I'm going to lift between the pocket bag and the pant so that all I'm doing is stitching between the welt pocket piece and the pocket bag and not through the actual pant piece. So just pull your pant piece to make sure that it's nice and clean and that you've not got anything stuck underneath that you're not going to have to unpick later and then just stitch. How far from the edge are you stitching? Um, I will, this is quite close to the edge, so I will probably snip some of that off. Um, So it's probably about half an inch because this will get folded over um, when you get to the point where you're um, sealing up the pocket bag. So yeah, it's a little bit wider on this side. So, so you can see there that I've stitched that down. And then I'm going to flip the pant. And I'm going to stitch in the ditch from one corner on the bottom edge down to the other. And now because I'm using black thread, I don't expect that my stitch Will disappear. If you were doing this on a black pant, then your stitching would probably disappear. But I'm using black because it makes it easier for you to see it on the screen. Everyone with me so far? Yeah. I can't. I can't see them. I'm just. I don't know whether anyone's still listening. Whether everyone's gone to sleep. I, I can see them. They're listening. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's quite disconcerting. Mm, fine. To like be talking and have absolutely no no idea whether anyone's still there. Or whether You're doing gone. great. <laughs> you left me on my own talking to myself. <laughs> Guys, if you want to my <laughs> feedback, you would love that. <laughs> oh, I I've done this in the wrong order as well. This is... Right. This is because I got um, disconcerted. I'm just having to unpick this because...
you need to be able to access this. So you've got your triangular flappy bits. Come on, you cut. I'm like an idiot. I forgot to do that bit. See, I had to learn how to do this. I have a machine at work that does this. All I have to do is make sure I put all the pieces in, in the right order and facing the right way. And then I just hit a pedal and the machine does the whole damn lot for me. Um, but I broke that machine. Um, so I had to learn how to do it by hand. I, I think this is a story we need to hear at some point. <laughs> <laughs> oh mate it's like 50 grand's worth of equipment and they're like you can't do this with it and you can't do that with it and if you don't drop anything on the it's got two separate it's got two massive like they're like a foot long feet for doing these welt pockets um but if you drop them on the floor they break and they're really expensive um and i was changing them because i'd put a welt pocket in a pair of pants um, when we're making pants for a company called Hackett they always have a double welted pocket and um, I put a single welted pocket in so I had to unpick everything um, and change the foot and I was so wound up about the fact that I put the wrong kind of pocket in um, that I got really clumsy and forgot to basically not drop this foot and I dropped it on the floor um yeah so um I had to learn how to do this by hand manually because um they didn't want to spend like three grand on another foot so yeah <laughs> that's the funny story about how thick broke some stuff at work <laughs> This is this is all <laughs> not painting myself in a very good light here. <laughs> right, okay. So you have your little triangly bits. So those triangly bits are um what sticks out. Um and inside. Now that would normally be sealed up if you'd stitched a, a box instead of tram lines. Um, but because you haven't stitched a box instead of tram lines, you've got to sew it up. So you want your pant piece pulled clear, your pocket bag pulled clear. You've got all of your triangles all together and you've got your interfacing and your welt pocket. And your welt pocket the top part needs to sit away so you've got quite a few layers to stitch through and what you're going to do i'll mark it for you so that you can see it because once i've stitched it you won't be able to see it you're going to stitch as far as close in without actually catching the pocket bag or the actual pant piece from one side down to the other. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, cool. Right, so that's what you're going to do. It doesn't matter if you go over, like over the top or over the bottom, as long as you don't catch your pocket bag material in. And you're going to stitch over it couple of times so you can see there hopefully I'm pointing this the right way so you've got that there and then you've got all your triangly flappy bits all stitched down so that when you turn it the right way out oh that's so clean yeah isn't it it's so much easier to do it this way. Whereas if you've, if you've already stitched down here, you end up with the bit kind of, you end up with it poking through like that, don't you? Mm. And then it just looks crap. So if you do it like this, so much easier. As long as you remember to do it in the right order, don't do it the way I've just done it. 
but you have to unpick those. So you're just going to repeat the same steps on the opposite side. So you're pulling the pant clear and the pocket bag clear. You've got your top edge clear and you're just making sure that the top edge of your welt sits in the corner. Oh, I've got a little hair a bit. So you have like so. Can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very lovely. This is where. It gets a bit fiddly now. So, yeah, you still haven't pressed this top edge down because this needs to come down like that, I think. So, on the charity, on the, on the pattern piece that I sent you for the pocket bag, it did have little notches in it, didn't it? Uh, for the pocket bag? Um, yeah. let me check. I believe I have a notch. Hold on, let me pull it up. Side pocket yeah. bag? No, yeah. not. Okay, yeah? Um, yes, it has two, it appears to have two notches. Three notches, mm -hmm. maybe. Okay, well, you should, you should have one notch on each side. And then further down, there should be one on each side as well. There and there. If you haven't, it doesn't matter. It just makes lining everything up easier um, because what you're going to do in a minute is pull that up and then pull it through. So you'll be working the pocket bag inside out. But what we've got to do first is put the facing on. So on your lower set of notches, so if you're looking at it like that, you see that? I was looking at a different pocket bag, I think. I'm sorry. I think I only sent you two. There should be a square one and a round one. Um, if you haven't, if, I, if I've been an idiot and haven't put um, notches on, um, what you need to do is just mark with something that's visible on whatever pocket bag material you've picked, um, a point about five inches down from the top and about five inches up from the bottom. Um, so that when you lift and flip them around, your notches are sitting in the same place and your pocket bag ends up at roughly the same point. I just wanted to check, do you guys have the uh, pocket piece that she's referring to? I think for the for that pocket bag, I think you mm. just asked them to cut a rectangle, Felicity. Yeah, we got the round one, if I believe. Hold on one second. The round one's next week. Yeah. Okay, yeah, they've got the round one. I think maybe yeah. for the other pocket bag, you had said to cut 22 inches by eight inches, yeah? Yeah. Is that the one? Yeah, that is, yeah. Okay, okay, so we don't have any notches because we just had the measurements for that one. Oh, right, okay, so you need to measure a point on both sides of your rectangle, five inches up from the bottom and five inches down from the top. And it doesn't matter what you used to do it, as long as it's visible on whatever color fabric you've, you've picked for your pocket bag. Okay, is everybody following? 
Okay. Yeah, is everybody caught up? Or most that's watching. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So they, everybody's got the piece that they need. Right. Okay. So they've marked. So what you're going to do is you're going to put your facing piece that had the corners cut off pointing down. Pointing down. It's really hard doing things upside down. So you're going to put it point, pointing down and what you're going to do is stitch from that corner to that corner, straight line, just across. Um, try and get your pocket piece sitting roughly central on your um, pocket bag. Mine's not quite, mine's slightly out. And then what you're going to do is flip that and press it. Okay, so we've pressed it. So we've got our pocket facing meeting up. And what we're going to do, it will all make sense. But when it's together, you'll be like, ha. Ah. But when we're actually doing it, it's like, huh? So what we're going to do is line that up like that so that when we put our when we put our pocket piece when we stitch our pocket bags down I need to lift time slightly I think what you're going to do is line up those two marks that you made that were five inches from the top and five inches from the bottom. They're going to line up so that when you put your the top of your pocket bag on, it's nice and flat and straight. And both sides of it will be caught inside the waistband, especially if you're not using a waistband curtain. You're just doing a hand stitched waistband where you're folding your waistband facing over and then um, slip stitching it in place. You want all of these bits inside the waistband so that you've got no raw edges showing. So, we're going to lift the top layer of the pocket bag back. Stretch that over a little. Okay. And then what we're going to do is really carefully, can you see? That's out of the way. You've got the top edge. of your pocket facing with your welt pocket piece, your interfacing and your seam allowance from when you cut the hole to begin with. So you're gonna to have to stitch through all of those layers. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna stitch from corner to corner and you want your stitching as close to your original stitch line as you can get it. Um, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna see if I can run a little bit of wax over mine so that you can see. As 
that made it visible on screen? Can you see that? Just a very I probably, little, a little I probably bit. shouldn't have used black cabbage, yeah. really. Um, Hold up close. Yeah. yeah, much better. Yeah. So what you're going to do, uh, where where my stitch line is, I'm going to stitch as close as I can get to that stitch line, but on the bottom side, on this side. Yeah. But you want it as close as you can get it or on um, the stitch line. So again, like you were when you were doing the Vs, the little flappy Vs, um, it doesn't matter if you run off the edge, as long as you're not stitching before you hit the seam allowance, the, the snipped seam allowance of your actual pocket. Okay. I find it easier to lift that slightly, slip my finger underneath and just pull the welt out of the way slightly because unless you've got um, a foot that will run on two different levels, you might find that your sewing machine will want to spit you one way or the other. Um, so if that welt pocket is lifted out of the way slightly, it might make it slightly easier for you. And then you can just kind of force the foot to stay in place. And you need to just make sure that everything's held nice and straight. So I've stitched along there again. And you can see that I've, I've caught in that part of the pocket bag, but it doesn't really matter. So that, this is, this is where it gets cozy. So I don't know if you can see, inside my pocket bag. <laughs> we can see it now. Yeah. So you've got, now depending on how much, where you place the, this bit, you may find that you've only got quite a, like I have, you've only got quite a stingy facing, um, or it might be a bit longer. Neither way is wrong. It just means that if the pocket opens slightly, it doesn't reveal the black underneath. Right. This is where it gets exciting. I'm supposed to add. So what you're going to do, you're going to put your hand in the pocket. And you're going to grab hold of the pocket bag and pull it through so that the inside of your pocket bag is on the outside of your pant. I'm just gonna make sure that I have actually. Right, if you've done this nice and clean, like I've done it on this side, you won't have any of the other layer of um, green showing through. Um, this side, not so clean. So I'm just gonna neaten that up a little bit before I get to the point where I've got, I can't go back. I appreciate that you're showing some of the um, errors that can happen when you're sewing and how you that's really <laughs> Yes, I'm doing it deliberately. <laughs> This is why you want your stitch line underneath your original seam line and not 
above it because if you go above it, that's when and I fixed it. Oh, oh. disco lights. So yeah, that's now nice and clean. So yes, back. So hand inside the pocket, pull the pocket bag all the way through. All the way through. Right, now what you need to do is look for those notches that you call um, marks that you put on the side of your pocket bags earlier. And you're going to line them up. So I'll show you where mine are. So where I've marked with wax, that's where my notches are. So I'm going to line those up. I'm going to hold that, make sure it's nice and clean and not wrinkled. And I'm just going to pull it tight and I'm going to stitch probably um, my, well, my foot is a quarter inch foot from needle to the edge of the foot or just under. So it'll be about a quarter of an inch seam allowance. It doesn't matter if you go slightly above the notches or just below. It's just nice basically so that you know that your, your pocket bag is lined up and you won't end up with like one side like really long and the other side not long enough. And then you're going to do the same on the other side. So I'm going to mark my notch so that I can see it because I obviously I'm sewing on black. So make sure that everything's pulled out of the way and it's nice and clean. And I've only got two layers of fabric that are going to go underneath the foot. You don't want to stitch like three bits of your pocket bag together because I've done that before. Okay. So you're going to push your pocket bag back all the way through, put your finger into the corner to pop the fingers out, uh, the corners out, sorry. Right, so you've got a pocket bag, can everyone see this? You've got a pocket bag that basically stitched halfway up and then like a flappy bit at the top. So what you're going to do, um, you always start with the straight edge and not the edge that's cut the slight curve, just because it's easier. And you're basically going to circle around and it'll end up looking like a bit like a French seam, really. Um, I don't normally press these at work before I do them. I just do them straight off because I'm lazy and I'm, I'm under time pressures. If you wanted to, you could press this before you did it. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to fold under on the bottom edge, fold under on the top edge, pull, and that should hopefully then just pop those insides together. Now what I tend to do is I tend to keep hold of where the pocket bag splits I keep hold of that because that's what tells me that I've got everything lined up. And then all I'm doing, again, is stitching. Down. And if you haven't pressed this like I haven't, then you might just have to manually adjust it so that you've got your seam on the very edge and it's not rolled under underneath or it's not rolled under uh, over on the top. 
it has to be like on the edge. Otherwise my QC will send it back because it's not neat. And then you take it to the corner, turn it. And I'm just gonna pinch that seam, make sure I've got it nice and straight and clean. Turn. Oh, now mine's rolled slightly, so I'm gonna have to compensate. So I'm just gonna pull slightly at the underneath layer. Okay, I'm gonna pull all this top layer out of the way. Open it up. Now, if you need to snip away some of this bulk to be able to run your, your sewing machine foot over, that's fine. You stitched it all down inside, it's nice and tidy. It doesn't matter if you need to snip some of it off. I might snip some of that off. So I think that might push me out off balance if I don't. Uh, yeah, at work, we just toss scrap bits of fabric on the floor because we have a cleaner. I don't have a cleaner at home. I have to pick it up afterwards. <laughs> So, this is your best friend. Um, I use it for all sorts. If I need to poke out corners, um, if I need it to hold stuff where I don't really get my finger too close to where um, my needle's going to be, um, I use it as a kind of stick it in place, stab it down, behave um, sort of thing. So, ask any seasoned sewer, I hate that word, dressmaker, tailor, best piece of kit you can have, seam ripper. Okay, so I've got over that pump bit there, I've got my bottom layer of pocket lining nice and clean. Okay. And in about an inch and a half, I'm going to hit that curve. So what I'm going to do is just fold it so that my seam follows that curve. Because what you don't want, because this, this edge, this um, curved edge, will sit against your um, waist seam. So what you don't want to do is have this running too close to your waist seam because you run the risk of it bunching up. Um, it might look um, a bit lumpy. Um, especially if you're doing a pair of trousers for a smaller person and you haven't cut the pocket bag down. So just turn slightly, stitch that down. So you have stitched all the way around your pocket bag. Okay, so you just turned in a little bit more seam allowance towards the top, am, or am I understanding correctly? Yeah, I mean, my, my pocket bag had a slight curve cut onto it on one edge. Um, but if you've just got straight pocket bags, um, then yeah, just turn a little bit extra in so that it's, can you see that against, against me? Can you see that it's got a slight curve to it? Yes, up at the top. Yeah, so this bit here is going to go against your waist seam. So if you're making a pair of trousers for like some skinny little runt who's got like a 28 inch waist, then your seam is gonna be like here. It's gonna be like really close. Mm. So that's why we pull that in because if this was straight, you would be then running this into the seam which means that you'd have to force it to lie flat and go around the curve and it, it won't do that if yeah. it doesn't like it. So, and that is it. That is your enclosed pocket bag. I'm just going to give that got a little bit of a bubble there. Give it a quick press. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, 
on that. I popped my seam slightly there. I took, I was too daring. And I took it, excuse me, I took it too, I took my cut too close to the stitching. Mm. Can you see that? There's a little bit of... A little black poking through. Just it's slightly. popped slightly. Yeah. So... Fail. Yeah, my QC <laughs> would come back back and go, that's shit, do it again. It's lovely, so, though. even so. Even so, yes. <laughs> Pocket seam aside, so that is your your belt pocket. You can make this as deep as you want, as shallow as you want. You just all you do is alter the depth of your tram lines. Um, so you could have it so that it was like an inch if you wanted, um, or you could have it a quarter inch. Um, and you, what I did up until the point where you stitched the beads down. It's exactly the same. All you're doing is, is mirroring what you've done on that top edge with a double welted pocket. Mm. All you need to do when you do your tram lines is make sure that the figure that you've picked is actually divisible by two and is easily divisible by two. Um, rather than having to try and measure things like millimeters or whatever, um, round it to like the nearest five. Um, or the nearest eighth of an inch or sixteenth of an inch. Um, but that that's it. It's really not that hard. Yay! Thank I you really so like much. this. I can't so, wait to put this out. So you would put if you wanted to put a buttonhole in, you would put your buttonhole in um, before you basically sewed your pocket bag up and before you stitched. It, it's all hidden inside here now. All your, all your gunge is inside there. Okay. So if you wanted to put um, a buttonhole in, you would do it before you attached that gunge to the top. Because then you can get your pocket lying nice and flat and you can get your underneath layer tucked away, out of the way. Um, if you wanted to put a label on your pocket, you would put that on um, at the point before you um, stitched up the pocket bag. Um, I tend to leave it to that point rather than doing it at the very, very beginning because um, I sometimes forget that I've put it on and I end up with the label inside the pocket, which kind of defeats the object of the <laughs> exercise. <laughs> so... Oh, uh, no, honestly, if, if you worked with me, you just hit, I, I sit on my own on one side of the factory when I'm in work. Um, I, sit on, I sit on my own and um, the nearest girl to me is my friend Sarah, who does the hand finishing on the jacket. And very occasionally, um, all she will hear me say is, oh, you bastard, because I've put a label in the wrong way around and it's inside <laughs> the pocket bag. And I can just hear her chuckling. Thank God. Click the bad word. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> but yeah. Um, but that's it. So by stitch, that's the important bit, is, is those bits, because by stitching those after you've actually put the welt in, makes it so much easier and so much cleaner. And you don't get any puckering. I love it. Um, how much of a seam allowance did you do when you did the second go round on the pocket? Same. Okay, so about a quarter. Yeah, about a quarter in. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. So has anybody got any questions? Uh, would you typically use like a, a uh, deeper... Oh gosh, I'm sorry. I can't think of the what, the what you called it, but the 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 forward part of the welt pocket. Would you use a deeper one for like a men's pant versus a woman's? Um. Well, this this is a, a based on a, a pattern I actually nobbled from work. So this is a, this is man's. Okay. Um. The only thing that I would do differently at work is obviously I would I wouldn't have put the dart in quite so long. Um. Mm. Our pants. Um. We only actually make about five different styles 
in terms of cut. Um, and two of those are the most popular. The, the other three come out once in a blue moon. Um, and it's all the other things that, that give it the variation that make it look not the same as another pair of pants. Um, so it would be things like um, you, what they call waistband furniture. So that would be like your strap and buckles, um, button and tabs, belt loops, um, or nothing. Um, depending on how confident he is that his pants are going to stay up. <laughs> um, but our, our darts, are all a lot shorter than they are on this pattern. Um, so at work, my dart would end about here and it wouldn't be as wide at the top. It would only be a quarter of an inch wide. It's so on a man's pattern. Um, depending on what era you go from, um, some 40s pants don't have a dart on the back seam for men's. Um, I've got four patterns I think for men's 40s and 50s pants and two of them have got darts and two of them haven't um so at work we would just have our our dart would end or it would disappear into that seam and it wouldn't reappear on that seam oh. that would be is that a difference between men's and women's or just a difference in the pattern design I think it's just a difference in the pattern because this has got quite a long dart um Whereas on women's patterns, it generally tends to be the front that has the longer dart, I think. And mm. um, the back dart always tends to be shorter because you've got um, the back curve going into the top of the bum um, to deal with. Whereas on the front, you don't have that. Your curve is higher up. So it tends to be a longer dart on the front because you haven't got as much to shape around. Right. Mm. So I think it is just this pattern. I've done it on a couple of patterns, pants that I own, that I made for myself. Um, and they've, I've just gone through the dark because I couldn't be, frankly, I couldn't be asked to reconfigure the dart and then compensate for the extra half inch fabric that I was adding in by making the dart smaller and then taking it off of the waistband, um, I, I couldn't be asked to faff around with that. So I just did the right. dart as it was on the pattern. Because um, I'm quite lazy. <laughs> no, you're efficient. There's a difference. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was just like, I really want a pair of trousers and I need them right by Friday. So just stuff it. I'm just going to do them as they are. I'm going to put a pocket in because I want pockets. <laughs> Why should men have any fun? Right. <laughs> right. Reach it. I don't know. It's like women's pockets and women's pockets pants. Women's pockets on pants. Sounds like I've been drinking. Um, <laughs> on crap. Like you literally, you can't put anything in them because they're like this big. They're either microscopic or non-functional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, no, we, we, we are entitled to have functional reasonable sized pockets in our pants I heartily agree with you 100%. <laughs> i'm preaching to the choir i know <laughs> do you do you have time flick to show the class your uh pants that you made for yourself those lovely ones that you sent me a picture of wow yes they're hanging up in the wardrobe darling off your pop what color um <laughs> red red wool Yes. Yes. Can you also get my yellow jacket, my yellow linen jacket? Don't just bring everything out of my wardrobe and go, here you are, find it. <laughs> That's what he normally does. If I say, can you go and find something for me? He'll bring me like a million things and go, it's one of these, isn't it? <laughs> Um, yeah, at least I think they're in my wardrobe. <laughs> That's okay. The students find out in, we'll find out in a minute. Yeah, and the students are <laughs> under 45, so we're fine. <laughs> yeah, I will. Um, I've asked him to bring my yellow linen jacket down as well because that will show you what um, I did a double welt pocket on that on the inside. Mm -hmm. I don't think I sent you pictures of that. No, I have to do this. I'm excited. <laughs> it's sexy. Mm -hmm. 
like literally only tailors get excited about world pockets everyone else is just like huh there are shows hey about pocket and they're like so oh, wonderful oh. though it's like homer simpson dribbling over donuts <laughs> <laughs> It is, it is literally like that. Like a, a good well pocket. Oh. It's gone ominously quiet upstairs. <laughs> it's going to come down and go, it's not there, can't find you. <laughs> hey. He's the man. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Purple, not red. Oh, pedant. Thank you, dearest. <laughs> oh. <Right. coughs> so I made these because I got bored and I had enough fabric left over. So I made a pair of um, like really wide legged kilots. And these have got the 1940s style, ridiculously long darting. So these are the pair that I was just like, I can't be asked. I'm just going to put the pocket in and leave it. I can't be asked to mess around with it. So those are the, the so just a pretty. little single well pocket. And then. So this is what I mean by um, the importance of having your pocket bag set up slightly from your waistband so that when you stitch your waistband down. It hides the sins. Uh -huh. mm. It seals it all up and everything just gets tucked away and it just looks really nice and clean. Um, the alternative is what we would do at work, um, which would be to put a curtain waistband on. So you would have this piece and it would be overlocked at the bottom. And then you would have another piece attached to that that's folded in half. And then you would pleat it at various points around. And all you would then do is lift up the curtain and backstitch or a running backstitch into your buckram underneath so that when you lift the curtain up, it's all stitched down and it's hid your stitches are effectively hidden within the overlocking. But um, that doesn't tend to be so much of a common feature on women's trousers on like um, on the high street, or at least not here. So I just, and I also didn't have enough fabric to do a curtain piece that matched this. So I just did the one piece and then hand stitched it down. So it's all hand stitched. I don't know if you can see. Mm. It really, really close up. <laughs> Oh, yep, it focused. Oh. Can, you, can you see, if I just pull it slightly, can you see it's all hand-stitched? Oh, uh, turn it turn it back slightly so that we can see, because it's in the shadow. Yeah, there okay, it is, yes, right I there. Uh... I love your contrasting fabric there. Um, guys, that's a kind of a fun feature that she's added. I actually, I'm not going to lie, I just wrote down textured waistbands, because that's very, very cool. Yeah, I mean it's it's just it's just cotton viscose stuff. But and I know I'm the only person that will see it apart from my you lot um, and my husband. Um, but it's just it's one of those kind of fun things that you know is there. It's like wearing Tom and Jerry pants. <laughs> Don't tell them our secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my husband's like 54 and wears Tom and Jerry fan. <laughs> so this is a pair of pants um, that I made um, following my own pattern at home, um, but using basically all of the techniques that I would use at work, apart from the curtain on the waistband. Um, so I have a metal zip front fly. Tell me if I'm, am I pointing this in the right place? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. see it. <laughs> so, let's pause it. 
And you guys and I have a fancy cut bearer on a lot of men's pants now. The bear is like really boring and it would just be like that straight down. But I really like the kind of pointy and then curvy bit. And I think you sent us that pattern piece also. So if you guys want to play with that. Yeah. So the, if you're going to have a go at doing this, you need to put your waistband on first and you need to put your zip in first um, first because what you do is you stitch down. Um, depending on whether um, she wants me to or not, I'm more than happy to come back um, in a couple of months and show you how to put a proper tailored fly in. If I'm that's something that you'd be interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because yeah. the piece that I sent you for this is a marker. It's not how you would actually cut the fabric. It is purely a marker. So you would draw around it as a template and then you would stitch on that line. Um, if you stick, if you cut it, if you use it as a cut, if you use it to cut your fabric, it will end up too small. Because no seam allowance. Yeah, there's, because it, it is literally, it's the marker for your, your stitch line. And then I have quarter top kits, which is what we're doing next week. So these are, that's where my seam is. So the edge of my pocket is here. Okay. So where the, the top, where the top of your pocket hits the waistband, if it hits it over here, then it's called non-seam pocket. If it's staggered off, it's called a quarter top pocket. And it doesn't matter how wide it runs, it's still called a quarter top pocket. Can you show them the, um, the button and button loop on your back pocket as well? Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm kind of working my way round. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so inside I have the same fabric. And then it's all faced. Oh, inside. Because I'm an absolute bugger for stuffing hands in pockets. And these are good pockets. These are like proper hand sized pockets that I can get like a mobile phone inside. Um, and then I have my. I think I was, yeah, I was really lazy on these ones because the dart was really long on these as well. So I just thought, uh, stuff it, I'm going through the dart. I'm not having my pocket all the way down there. It'd be halfway down the back of my leg. So I did that. And it has, can you see? It has a little button. With a little fab. Beautiful. So if you were going to put that in, if you're going to do something like that and put that in, you would put that into the, the seam um, at the point where you were stitching the top of the facing to the rest of your pocket pieces. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. Is everybody nodding? Yes. So you would <laughs> stitch it in then. So if you if you really wanted to. Um, what you could do is um, stitch it, unpick the centre bit where your dart is, and then push it through. Make sure that you've got it placed nice and properly, and then restitch over it a couple of times. Um, and then it's and then because of you've got everything pointing upwards, your tab automatically points downwards because it wants to go the way the rest of the fabric goes. Whereas if you had pressed your seam allowances pointing down, it wouldn't want to do that. It would want to do this. It would stick out, yeah. Yeah, it would be like proper fluffy. It'd be like Bugs Bunny's ears. <laughs> and again, it's the inside. So normally what we would do, if we were gonna put a label in, at work for like one of the visiting tailors and we would put it sort of here and I would put it on after I put the corner piece, the, 
piece that's got the corners cut off, I would put it on after I'd done that so I knew roughly where to place it below that stitched line. And before I pulled everything through. Okay. And it all inside out. If I was going to put a label on it. Um, but because these are for me, I haven't even put my own label in. I forgot. I thought I saw one in the waistband. No. Did I put one on on the other ones? I put one, I put some more on this one. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I usually put it on the waistband because it's easier. Um, and because it means I can hand sew it on if I need to. So if I want to change, like, the positioning or anything, I can just unpick my hand stitching. Whereas once it's on here, that, that's it, it's on there, it ain't moving. Mm-hmm. Um... So yeah, and then I've got like hand stitched hook and bar and then a button. So that button goes there and then there's a hook and bar and then there's another button. I like my trousers to stay up securely. <laughs> Nothing worse than standing up with your pants not following you. Well, and that's another thing, you know, if the men have it on their waistbands, why mm -hmm. not us as well? <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah. Um, so we will be doing quarter top pocket next week. Um, so that's that. Um, the only thing that um, you'll need to do that you won't be able to, that, or that you would do if you were um, doing a quarter top pocket at home that I won't be able to show you. I'll show you where you need to do it and at what point, but we won't actually be able to do it, is um, there is... A, I don't know if you can see, there's a bar tack there, mm -hmm. um, yes. which I would normally do on my other machine uh, with um, a, a two or three millimetre wide um, satin stitch, like a really, really tight zigzag. Because um, all it does, and you when you stitch your side piece down, you effectively stitch over that bar tack and it means that when you put your hands in your pockets if you're like really enthusiastic about shoving your hands in your pockets because you're having like a kevin and perry moment you're not <laughs> going to rip your pocket oh you, you guys aren't going to know who kevin and perry are are you <laughs> no but i'm having a kind of a mental image here and it's entertaining nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like really really weird comedy from like the late 80s early 90s it's, was it harry enfield and kathy burke um and they basically pay, played these two like teenagers that were wore like baseball hats and baggy jeans and every time they asked to do, to do something by their incredibly reasonable and tolerant parents all they would get is oh it's so unfair <laughs> <laughs> oh. basically just being teenage assholes mm -hmm. um but it was very very funny so anytime you're kind of like shoving your hands in your pockets and you're having a bit of a kevin and perry moment <laughs> that rock stops you from ripping your pant pocket. Wonderful. Uh, this is, by um, the way, guys, the same function uh, that rivets serve in jeans pockets. Uh huh. Yep. Totally yeah, the same. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. Last one, and then I'll let you all go and get some lunch or whatever mm -hmm. it is over there. Uh, so, this is a, a double. <laughs> double welt pocket i love your lining here oh my gosh <laughs> it's so cute isn't it yes. i i got it to make a dress out of um and i had enough left over but it wasn't quite enough to do like a whole to line the whole jacket with so um i only i was only able to line like basically the, the front half of each side so the back is plain white and the sleeves are plain white. Clever. But I really wanted this in this jacket. Um, so yeah. Still goes um, so like very the waist coat that I made to match. We, oh, which has also got a double welt pocket on. It's double welt oh, pockets, is it? It's a little too long. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Nice. Beautiful. So, yeah, and then you bar tack 
down the edges. Okay, I was going to ask what, what you had going on there, so yeah. Yeah, that's why it looks a bit kind of obvious. Um, now, um, I'm, I'm locked into a running feud with um, my boss about this because I'm of the opinion that when you're doing a welt pocket, at the point where you're stitching down those little flappy V things, um, if you're doing stitching, if you're doing a sort of, you know, four or five thing pass over those Vs, mm -hmm. they don't need bar tacking. It just looks untidy. Um, but my boss is of the opinion that I should bar tack them and I'm locked into this running argument with them because I refuse to do them. And then I, get, I finish the pant and he goes, yeah, but you haven't done this. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> because it looks rubbish. <laughs> because I've, I've already stitched five or six times underneath. That thing is not coming undone. That, it doesn't need bar tacks for security. Um, so, yeah. Mm. I, have, I have like a really, really big, big argument with him about not doing them, don't, not doing them. <laughs> <laughs> this gets back um, into what I tell you guys all the time, that there's often more than one right way to do things. Yeah. That's right here. <laughs> yeah, so my, my boss is of the opinion that there's only one right way to do it, and that's his way. Um, and that's not an opinion that I share. So hmm. I did, I did these as a, because these are, this is quite a small, um, double welt pocket. I did these really small. These are like really, really tiny. You can see how small they are. So I had to do this more like a bound buttonhole. So I had to stitch over and you can see the difference. Can you see mm. there? It's not as clean and it's a little bit puckered. Yeah. Um, and the same on this, it's not a nice clean. Um, but I'm going to have an experiment at some point and see whether I can actually do a bound buttonhole my way, um, which would mean that I could then do these my way. Um, because in theory, a single welt pocket is just a bound buttonhole. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that you're putting a pocket bag over it instead of having a lining um, or a facing covering it. And then all you're doing is slit, put, cutting a slit into the lining or the facing, folding it under and then hand stitching it down. That's, that's all it is. Yeah. That's the only difference. I'm hoping to see how I did the bound buttonholes on my pants that I abandoned. Um, Say again, sorry. I said I was just looking to see how I did these bound buttonholes. And I used the method in Claire Schaefer's book, and I don't think she said to do any uh, bar tack or anything on the end, if I remember right. But yeah, I haven't finished these. I've started making it personal. So. Yeah, no, I was really lazy on this. If I'd been like really, really like ultra wanting to be extra, mm -hmm. um, I would have done bound buttonholes in these, but I was lazy and I couldn't be bothered. Mm -hmm. It's so I, just all make, I just did machined button holes. If, if my yeah, if my if my machine will do a button hole that big, then that's what I will usually do is the machine. If my button is enormous and it won't go through my button holder, then I will do a bound button hole and I will sit there and whinge about it for like five days <laughs> because I I don't like doing them. But it's, it's weird, isn't it? Because it's exactly the same principle as doing a welt pocket, a double welt pocket. There's no difference at all. Well, so if you can do a double welt pocket, you can do a bound buttonhole. Brilliant. Thank you so, so much for your time. You've been absolutely <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop the recording.